Welcome to the fourth and final weekend of Concerts in the Barn online. We're very glad that you're joining us and we've got a great program for you. Two of my own per personal favorite chamber works by Brahms and by Schubert. It's been an extraordinary month and I feel really bittersweet about it all coming to an end. It's just been a wonderful time of a lot of fun, a lot of laughter and a lot of good music. And because I've had the artists all to myself, for this time. I thought you might be interested in knowing a few things about them that perhaps you didn't. For example, Kareem Fujiwara, our violist, is a champion geocacher, and there's absolutely nothing she loves more than tromping through an old growth forest, the better, bigger and more arduous trek the better, and trying to find something that's usually in a little Tupperware box in the bottom of a log. Chaz you may not know, is a champion kimchi maker, and he has been brewing up a storm while he's here, I believe in our library. And we are now searching for some kind of container in which he can take the kimchi back to Boulder, Colorado, as he drives without it spilling in the car. You might want to ask him about that personally. Now, Elisa Barston has just been an utter delight. She has the most infectious, addictive, fun laugh and she thinks everything that you say is hysterical which of course we all absolutely love and Ariana Nelson has just walked around the farm with this sort of serene poise and you never she just never lets you know if something is troubling her which other campers which we all become here might if she gets a bee sting it's all fine if a mouse runs across her floor she's all fine and she's like this on stage and not so she has been also an utter delight to have around. Now for 35 years, we have been putting on concerts in the barn, and I think that that is quite a significant legacy. It all began in 1984, when Alan Glitzen, who had spent about eight years fixing up the farm, opened the barn doors to the, his board and to the public to play chamber music with his group, the Philadelphia String Quartet, of which Alan was the founding violist. And since that time, we have had music coming out of the barn every single year. And that is quite an achievement. And it's particularly an achievement, I believe, this year, because we've done it in the middle of a national pandemic. No small feat. I cannot thank the musicians enough for all of their dedication, their good humor, and the incredible work that they have put into making this possible. And in particular, Chaz Weatherby, who has worked far harder than any artist should have to do to make sure that his music is heard in your home. We are very, very grateful to all of our musicians. And I'm only talking about the effort that they made to make these concerts possible. Their artistic, uh, their artistic talents go without question. I'm also very grateful to the people who have donated uh, to us during this time. It has been very, very helpful to us because we've had unexpected costs that we didn't think about when we were arranging this alternative season, and your donations have allowed us to balance our budget and start again for the, for the new year. Now, I'd like to tell you about a few things we've got planned for next year in a world where we can't plan very much in advance. So these are the things that we know for sure. There will be a festival next year, and we're hoping to make it longer. Six weeks is what we've been talking about in, uh, for the summer of, of 2021. The concerts will still remain free. Carpe Diem will be returning along with musical friends. And I believe that the musicians are already planning concerts and we, are, we have two special things to tell you about. One is a concert that is really an homage to the Philadelphia String Quartet and the work that they did here in the early years and really put concerts in the barn on the map. The other thing that we're hoping to accomplish is to have a work commissioned by Kareem Fujiwara. Now you're familiar with her pieces if you've, if you've come here for any length of time. We, her Six Tasty Caprices, her beloved Montana Suite have been performed here, and this year you heard the Claudel Suite. So we're hoping very much that we will be able to raise enough money to commission a piece for her to perform next year. It would be quite a treat. We've got lots of work to do after the musicians leave me and uh, we can still use your help. So if you 
like what you hear today and you have the, the funds to help us, please consider making a gift to us today so we can continue our work now for the summer of 2021. One other thing that I mentioned in passing last week, but I want to iterate, is that we are planning on putting together a ticket tracking uh, system so that even though our concerts are free, if there is any kind of social distancing that is necessary, we will be able to ask people to sign up so we can get a firm count of who can be on the farm. That way you can be here and we can all still be safe. In the meantime, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the summer. Please still stay healthy and Alan and I look forward to greeting you at the farm next summer. Actually, I wanna know when the first time both of you, each of you respond uh, yourselves, played this piece for the first time. You have a great story. Well, I'll go first. So I have a special place in my heart for this piece and in conjunction with this place because um, the very first time I got to play on the farm, I was 16 years old and I played Schubert cello quintet. I played the second cello part. So I'm moving up in the world, All right. giving, taking a crack at uh, first cello. Um, <laughs> but it's just a, a wonderful piece. And as cellists, you know, it's just one of the most fun things to play. And it's been a pleasure to play with Walter, of course, and um, everyone else, of course. But it's, that's my, my experience, my first experience. What about you? Honestly, I can't remember the first time I played it. <laughs> I was trying to think about that. And... I'm sure I read it as a teenager, but I don't think the first real performance of this I had was until sometime in my 20s. I just don't even know. I was playing so much chamber music at the time that it kind of all falls together at this point. But I do remember, you know, the awareness of the piece was always there. It's a fantastic piece. And um, how many pieces have the major memorable theme in the first movement gets presented by two cellos first, and then by viola and cello also. But basically, the presentation of the theme is done by the the low strings, as we like to call ourselves. In as the it should be. Yes, and it's been <laughs> wonderful playing with all of you, and Ariane's doing a great job with the first cello part. Bravo. Thank you. <laughs> now, when was this piece written? Was it 1820? Eight, I think. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, and as such, it's, it's like, um, it's a massive work on the magnitude of his late quartets. It's really big. It's long. The themes are very involved. And because it's a quintet as opposed to a quartet, it's even more interesting. He did not shy away from using everybody all the time. It's not like some quintets where you have one person who really isn't doing anything. They're kind of sitting, waiting their turn. No, he's, he's, got, he's got the group going pretty much with interesting material all the time, which is it's a great thing for us. I, I have a special favorite moment in the third movement when the cellos come rumbling in. It's my favorite place. I think the first time I became aware of this piece was in college. It was a a reading session with like-minded chamber music nuts like myself. And I, I had never occurred to me that you could have two cellos together in a piece. Like, I was pretty green, but <laughs> admittedly. Um, and I fell in love with the piece. And then I found out, of course, that it's all these people. This is the piece that I want on my desert island in that, that, uh, that saying that we have the piece that you would take with you. or mm. Yeah, it's everybody's. Favorite piece, so many singable melodies, so many amazing themes. The slow movement, I think, is the one that is very, very magical. Um, for me, I think my most memorable one of performance of that would have been with my Carpe Diem colleagues and Yo-Yo Ma. Ah, nice. Uh, we played um, an encore after a, a symphony concert, which... To this day, I still can't believe it was true. And I remember playing and being very nervous and kind of jangled and then looking over and saying, wow, those cellos sound really good. Whoa, it's Yo-Yo Ma. Pinch me. <laughs> nice. That was 
awesome. that was my my a very fond memory but this is also a very fond mm. experience one of the other again schubert in his later years which of course is not really very old um he liked to explore extremes um i think one of my favorite places is in the last movement where the entire group is playing sort of undulating melodies at three pianos or triple pianissimo dynamic, which is like really hardly audible or should be hardly audible. And it's just this, this moment of um, sort of undulating notes and then lands on a chord and then more notes and it lands on another chord. And it's just like, it's one of my favorite spots because you don't get to do this kind of thing in most chamber music, not to that extreme measure. And he was not at all shy about going for really, I would say, pretty extreme moments. So that's, that's another wonderful thing about this piece. And like you say about the rumbling cellos, it's the same thing. You know, when he wanted to make the cellos be really prominent, he just wrote them in unison. So now it's two cellos instead of one playing the same thing against the same other three people in the quartet. You know, that's okay. <laughs> it's all about the cellos, really. It really is. Yeah. And that's why we love this piece. <laughs>
Thank you. 
All right. Well, the next piece on the program is the sextet, the string sextet by Brahms. And this is also, like the Schubert, I think for many of us, it is kind of a desert island piece. It's uh, such, such an incredible work. There's actually not very many sextets in the literature at all. Um, two violins, two violas, two cello. There's the two by Brahms. Um, that's uh, Tchaikovsky. Right, the Souvenir de Florence. And I think Dvorak has one too, which I've never played, I think. It's maybe that's rare because it's hard to handle the extra forces without too many lines starting to feel like they're just being doubled and starting to feel orchestral. And what's amazing about this piece is the ways that Brahms finds two duets, uh, a, a duet here, a duet here, a duet here, or sometimes three instruments working together, one pinning down the bass. Like he, he splits them up in different ways, and yet um, most of the voices have moments of real solo um, identity, which is what we think of with chamber music, the combination of both ensemble and solo um, playing wrapped up in one, um, one genre. I don't know. It's a really, a really good point. Um, something that you just made me think of with that is, you know, how you, um, as a kid in music, you know, so many chamber music parties involve reading this and the other, you know, big chamber music works like the Mendelssohn Octet, you know, anything that you can get your hands on for a bigger group to read. Um, and one of the things that always happens at these like chamber music party readings when you're a kid is everybody plays their part really loud <laughs> right <laughs> through the whole thing you know and then it's the kind of thing when you put it together the professional group like this where you're really trying to you know work on the balances and realize what needs to come out um and then of course having the added lovely covid bonus of you know having to sit way further apart than we ordinarily would and then you're not really sure how loud you should be playing to balance things out because you're not hearing in the way that you were before so it's particularly interesting time to put this piece together um, and really try and um, weed out extraneous things and make sure that main voices are heard and really think about what we want to have come through one of the things that's nice for me is um, violinists are used to playing chamber music together because it's virtually always two of you. But it's so nice to have two violas. Um, and the sonority um, is just so, so lovely when we have little, little even just um, commentary on a, on a tune. Not, al not always the tune, but just little things that we do together. And it, that's really, really fun. So it's been a fantastic time. Yeah, we spoke last week with our program about um, how great composers can can be um, can, pr can practice such incredible economy w by generating so much from so little and this piece is a great example of that starts with the viola um, playing that undulating uh, half step um, figure and between the half step and then when the tune starts the this um, leap of a fifth that happens twice um, with a half step next uh, neighboring from that I mean that's pretty much like the whole work because right. he puts he uses those two things just for almost everything the, the beginning of the second movement which is the same two notes in the violin that that I played in the stretched out version you know um, and the th same for the third and fourth I mean it's just over and over again he finds inventive ways to transform those two little uh, motivic ideas um, into so many different textures, mm -hmm. moods, movements, everything. It's just pretty amazing. It's like he planted a seed right at the beginning right. and it grew into a whole forest. Yeah. And I love finding nuggets of those things. For example, one of my favorite parts is at the end of the third movement where, of course, it's my part. <laughs> so I, it's all about you, I found Lisa. it because I'm playing that part. <laughs> but, you know, where there's the... Um, I have the last motive at the very end, you know, B, E, F sharp, B, 
and it just sneaks in right at the end as it's fading out and it's so beautiful and it you could be lost and buried in there but there it was sparkling through you know well i mean hopefully when i wear this it will be sparkling through but i mean it's in the music sparkling through <laughs> and it doesn't matter if you know any of those those elements that are sort of building the piece because the skill of a Brahms or any other great composer is that you can just listen to it and it's just beautiful. Um, but then as we work on it and we look at these little things and appreciate all, all that much more about how, how, uh, just how many different l layers you can, you can peel back and find more and more. Um, One thing I love about this piece is the moods because a lot of it to me sounds sweet and nostalgic. There's a section that sounds like um, a rustic dance. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many different moods and um, it's kind of unique that way and just how far afield it goes. Right. It's really great. Thank you. 
We can say thank you. Thanks thank you. Watching. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks so for much. listening. The 28th. I believe so. I don't know. The day after Dave Beethoven died. I don't I believe know. that's correct. <laughs> we do not know. And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> I'm talking, I'm talking in my normal speaking voice. And I'm talking, oh. Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Pass it. You're going to pass it. And me. I'm going to hold it. <laughs> how, do, how is my hair? Um, oh, oh, my God. It looks hair. fabulous. It, you need to pull Don't it ask about my hair. I want it. Something about the Schubert Quintet. <laughs> well, we're, out. we're doing fine so far. Okay, so that was that was the opening volley. Let's see what's well, the next, what's the uh, next thing we're gonna hit. And now, when? I guess I was. <laughs> you didn't ask me to leave though. <laughs> Hi. Hi there. Am I starting? Sure. All right. I think we wrapped that up. I think we did. <laughs> it's a wrap. Wait, wait. Somebody That's, how does it Somebody? look? Ready? Is that the thank you? I don't know. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank thanks. You. Thank you. Oh, wait, can we all be seen? Oh. If, okay. Well, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Probably. Thank you. I'll look. Yeah, why don't you look and see? I'll be Otherwise, down. I can see. Is this? Is there going to be a blooper tape? There might be. Could be. <laughs> Yay. Okay. I think there's room if you stay exactly like that. Talk. I'm staying. Don't move. My and then are we all like saying money. thank you? <laughs> Movement for Dave. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. That's really good. Was that okay? Why is that? Uh, I think we got, got everything. I am not listening to that. Oh, I'm never. I'm ne-